makes me feel like I'm not alone. Treat people like uh, like you'd treat anybody. Like treat anybody, say hi, how's it going? I don't want to. I still got things I want to do. So look, if they get in the way, I'll deal with it. Okay, I think that's it for tonight. Dad, another story, please? I don't think so. You need to get some rest. Please. What do you want to hear? A scary story. A scary story? How are you going to go to sleep after a scary story? Dad, I promise I will. Please. Alright, this is the last one for tonight. It was the summer of 1986, an eerie night at Camp Hawthorne. Two camp counselors were out at the main grounds unaware of the horror of the night to come. I don't get it, I told her 10 p.m. Where is Jessica? Maybe she's avoiding you. Dude. Hi, Jackson. Hi, Roger. Sorry I was late. I was making sure all the campers were asleep. Hey, glad you could make it. Where's the fire? I thought we were making s'mores. Oh yeah, um, Roger was supposed to get the firewood. Get the what? Get the firewood. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. But what these counselors didn't know was that within the dark expanses of the woods lurked the mythic creature who possessed the forest. For hundreds of years, he was shackled in chains, confined and full of rage. But on this night, he broke free, and he was going to make sure anyone who dared to step foot on his grounds paid. Oh, cool. Great. Glad you could make it, Jessica. Get the firewood, Roger. Screw you. Jackson? Jessica? Hello? So, um, what's it like being the Arts and Crafts Director? It's fine. Nice. It's been like ten minutes. Shouldn't he be back by now? Who? Roger. Oh, yeah. He's probably fine. Should we go look for him? He probably decided to ditch and headed back to the cabins. Hey, plus, now we can finally have some alone time. Some what? Okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's go look for Roger. Roger! Roger! 
See, I told you he's probably back in bed right now. I don't know. I still think it's kind of weird. Don't you think he would have told us if he left? Well, he's an idiot like that. Gross. It's Roger's flashlight. What was that? <gasps> The end. Okay, time to go to sleep, buddy. What happened to the monster? He disappeared into the night, never to be seen again. All right, go to sleep. Good night, buddy. Good night. Swinging through the trees, and if we can't find nuts to eat, we munch each other's fleas. That's what Moon's been doing a little bit with you guys. He goes like this. I know, I know. Sadie comes every Friday to our classroom. Moon is a puppy. He has brown fur, kind of. I just grab Sadie as like. Fluffy and warm, playful, comforting, and she's very cute. He's a dog just like my dog. Therapy dogs reduce stress. They actually reduce cortisol, um, and your body releases oxytocin, which makes you relax and be less stressful. So therapy dogs in general around college students when they're taking final exams or in elementary school students um, really help a lot. There's tremendous benefit to having a dog in the classroom. When you have a dog in the classroom, kids learn how to calm down and then utilize the dog. Having a living animal and being able to touch the animal and be around the animal calms them. They learn how to go to the animal when they're feeling stress, so they recognize their own stress and they go to the animal and learn how to sit and calm down. Um, they also learn how to modulate their emotions. So when you're around an animal, kids are different. They're not as loud and aggressive because they realize the animals get, you know, respond and get scared from them. Our former principal had her dog certified and I saw the effect that her dogs had on the students. If they were having a hard day or if she needed to have a discussion with a student, she would bring her dogs and it just kind of relieved any, you know, anxiety that they would have. It kind of just cheered them up and, and made them happy. 
I became interested in the therapy dogs with Love on a Leash and my dog Lola was part of that program. When my dog Lola started getting older and didn't want to start all over again with another therapy dog, so I decided to get involved with Guide Dogs. So Guide Dogs for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that raised dogs in order to help visually impaired people so they become more independent. And I'm a puppy raiser, so what puppy raisers do is they take the puppies and do all the basic house training. When they're close to 18 months to two years, they go back to get formal training and so then I uh, started raising Linda for guide dogs and then now I have Moon and doing the same thing with Moon. The main role in the classroom for Moon is to get him adjusted to being in an environment where there's lots of people and lots of things going on and that's part of a commitment that you have with guide dogs that you socialize the dogs as much as you can. She usually walks around the desk or lays down. And while she's teaching, she'll like sleep next to the teacher's desk. And she also loves toys. <laughs> Moon likes to chew on everything. Whatever they drop, it is a huge from. And we, sometimes we get to take her out and run with her. She's crazy and she'll roll in the mud and stuff. The kids usually come in and greet Moon. He'll come to the carpet with me when we do calendar and walk out to the playground and different places that we have to go. Uh, the students interact with the dog by laying on him and playing with him. I think the best part of having her in the classroom is the effect it has on the students, that they are just really excited to have her and they enjoy her. It gives them some responsibility for caring for a dog and also it provides the calmness that sometimes kids need. They could come into my classroom and just read to the dog and not have anybody judge them and cuddle and provide a safe environment for that. If I can't bring her, they're really sad. She brings comfort to the kids. I felt good when I was with that one. It makes me feel more excited to come on Fridays because like, I know that there's going to be something fun happening with her. Sometimes when I'm doing my work and I'm on like a really hard level and I don't understand it, I'll go over and sit by Shady for a couple minutes and then it'll make me feel like calmed down and then I can do my work. I think that it works better when we're doing classroom. Moon helps me concentrate. It's really fun when Sadie's there. I could like pet her when I'm doing my work or frustrated. And if I don't feel good, she'll always just come by my desk. When I first started, I had a girl in my class that had more psychological issues. School was just too much, so she would just lay under the desk with the dog. You could just see it, that ease of and that tension and just go away from her. I had a boy that when he started kindergarten cried every single day and wouldn't come into the classroom. With the dog in here he knew he could come right in and be with the dog and his parents could leave. I like having Moon in the classroom with me. Because when I'm next to Moon, um, it's, it feels kind of nice. She's always been consistently the friendly dog. She finds the ones that need that little extra attention. I feel comfortable when I'm around a dog and I think a lot of people do too. It makes me feel like I'm not alone and I'm with somebody. If I had a dog in every grade I was in, that would be the best like, thing ever. The students consider her their class pet. Their whole emotional being in the class is just they're happy and they enjoy school. If I had a therapy dog, I think that would probably be my best memory of school, yeah, so growing you're like, up. You're like trying to bring that to your students now? Yes, yeah. Would you want to have a dog in your classroom again? You're in the middle now. I want to have a dog in the Yes. Uh, I don't know. Because I want to be able to pet him. Because dogs are the best thing ever.
Just get in and out. That's your only job. Hey man, that kid just looked me right in the eye. I don't no, know. Don't tell me you're backing out now. I can't. There's families here. There's kids. I, well, I'm not going to do this. This isn't right. Look around you. These kids have it much better than we did. I mean, just look at this There's families here. There's kids here. I, 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 no, 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 no. no. We came this. here for a reason, and we're not going to screw this up now. I mean, look. This is the only time when everyone is gone. We have to do it. Do you want the reward or not? Yeah. Look, look. If they get in the way, I'll deal with it. Now, do you remember what it looks like? It's a small yeah. silver box. That's all you have to worry about. I'll worry about everything else. Just get that box. What's inside? I, I don't know. It, it shouldn't even matter. It's for the boss.
My name is Monique Kunewalder. My name as a unmarried lady was Friedler. I was born in Belgium in a city called Antwerp. I think you know a little bit about World War II, and I think you know that those of us who were able to leave are ever, ever grateful that we survived the war. And then when we arrived in the United States, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided that he had welcomed too many refugees. And so he asked my family to choose between Canada and Latin America. And my father, who was always the boss, decided he wanted sunshine. So we went south. I think most European families wanted their kids to learn an instrument, mostly girls. And those of us in Mexico had to learn not only an instrument, but languages, Spanish. I went to school in Mexico probably until age 12. And Mexico was fabulous in those days. So I was happy to learn music. And then my parents decided that we needed to learn English. So they sent us both to Connecticut from Mexico. I was sent to a girls boarding school. We'd never left home. We never got on an airplane. Most of the girls there, <clears throat> I felt, were sort of kicked out of their homes, just like I felt I was kicked out of my home. I had two fabulous sisters in that school from Vienna. So then I really learned how to speak German. They taught me in German, they never learned English. I don't know how they taught all those girls in that boarding school. And they taught me how to love music. My brother went off to Hamilton College in New York. I went off to Oberlin College in Ohio. And then I was very happy to graduate from Oberlin uh, and I went to Geneva, Switzerland, to the Conservatory of Music in Geneva. You fall in love with music, and you fall in love with an instrument, and you try to get better. It has influenced me on a daily basis. I listen to music, I play music, I sight read. That's a gift that most teachers don't teach you. I'm very grateful that I was brought up and have lived in so many countries. And I love every country's music. And I can differentiate whether it's from what country, which instruments, you know, you really learn to train your ears. I'll tell you the Mexican composers, Latin American composers, we had a Brazilian performer here playing entirely Brazilian music the other day. If you know enough languages, you can learn to sing in various languages. You can learn to perform in various countries. The love for music comes as number one. I have never stopped playing chamber music. You always be positive. You always have to be, show them that music is your best friend, that music is your best medicine that if you're sad, if you're depressed, if you're unhappy, it's the best possible medicine you can have. Yo, what's up, Green Gang? It's your boy, Pierce Green, coming at you with another slappy video to brighten up your day. Today, we're going to be getting a rubber chicken and attaching it to the front of my car and then ramming into buildings. This is going to be so cool. Kyle, off the computer. Come help me clean your mess up from downstairs. But Mom, it's Pierce Green. Now. The girls are coming over soon. Oh my God. I got into it today from the manager from Bed Bath & Beyond. He would not give me the discount I needed for the plunger. Who cares if the coupon expired two years ago? It's all about good service. Middle management has been so aggressive these days. Tell me about it. You guys would not believe how many times I have to tell Kyle to get off his screens. Samantha had that issue too. At some point I just had to give in. It's their way of being social. 
I even got a few social media apps myself. It's really helped us bond. Wait, Karen, you have an Instagram, right? I have a Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, sweetie, you're so behind. (laughs) If you really want Kyle to listen, you have to be all over those technological innovations. <laughs> so, you want to be WeTube famous? Well, I've got you. To be WeTube famous, you just gotta get on that grind. You just gotta keep on doing it. Work at it every day. Every Punching day, out. every Punching hour. Out. You just gotta get up, go to your computer, and then just do it. Just, just do it. it. But if you really, really, really wanna be WeTube famous, then all you have to do is buy my, my starter kit. It's so easy. 9.99, seven installments. And then you'll be WeTube famous, guaranteed, 100%. A day in the life of a mom, right? Where do I even start? Do you get me, moms? You totally get me, right? And don't even get me started about afternoon activities. I mean, by the time I get done with the grocery shopping, get it all into the house, because who has time to meal prep, ladies? Really? Because then who would drive your son to practice or school or whatever other event he has going on? Don't ever tell him I told you this, but when he was four, He went to the playground and he was swinging so high and laughing so hard, he forgot his potty training. Oh my goodness, there was pee everywhere. Time for more coffee. No! Ugh, another accident. Clean up on aisle Kyle. Sorry, Karen crew. Mom, what did you post? The video on the WeTube? Yes, what else would it be? What's wrong with it? I was just trying out a new social media, sweetie. I thought it would help us bond. Bond? Are you serious? You really think posting an embarrassing story of me on the internet is going to help us bond? I just have a quick question for you. What does collab mean? Hi, Debbie, I need you to conference in Bernice. Thank you all for meeting me on such short notice. Don't mention it. We were worried about you. Yeah, what's with all the videos? Is this a midlife crisis or something? I only did it because you told me it would help me bond with Kyle. But it seems to have ruined everything. I meant make an Instagram and post pics of your kid, not make embarrassing videos. (laughs) Thing is, I kind of have a massive following now. And that Pierce guy that Kyle is obsessed with just reached out to me to create a video with him. What should I do? Karen, we love you, but you have to stop embarrassing yourself. Yeah, hon, seriously, you gotta stop. Today. Excuse me, could you guys turn that off? I have a special treat just for my son, Kyle. What's up? It's me, Pierce Green. Pierce Green. Can you believe it, sweetie? He's here! We're doing a... Isn't this your mom? Yes. What's your address? What? Can we meet her? Like, at my house?
Come on, Hugh. It'll be fun. I promise. I don't know, Dad. Everyone there is so much better than me. Ah, oh, come on. You're overthinking it again. Like, we paint all the time. Remember, you're your only competition. After the accident, he was diagnosed with synesthesia. He sees colors whenever he hears sounds. The doctor said it might be because of the trauma. Anyway, he used to love to paint with his dad, and I thought more art classes may help him get back on his feet. I'm so sorry to hear that. I'll look out for Hugh. He's in good hands. Thank you. for a quick moment. Okay, so as you know, the art competition work is due tomorrow. Um, you probably still have a little more time to put finishing touches on your work. Just let me know if you have any questions in the meantime. All right, thanks. Sorry, what was that? I was just checking on seeing where your progress was for your piece for the show. Oh, it's going all right, I guess, but I'm probably gonna stick with the pencil. You may want to think about branching out and using a little bit of color sometimes. I'll think about it, but I'm probably gonna stick with black and white. All right, we'll talk about it for the next project, okay? Miss Richards thinks I should go back to using the paints. Well, I think that's a great idea. Your old paintings always remind me of Dad. Not in a good way. What do you say? Everything reminds me of him. Every, every single sound, every single painting reminds me of that day in the car. The red, the, all those colors, and if it wasn't for any of that, I would still be doing painting, but it doesn't matter what I do anyways, because Dad's still gone, and there's just... I just... I just miss him so much. Hugh. If your dad were alive today, he would tell you to stop fighting yourself. Stop fighting the colors. Come here, I want to show you something. I was going to save it for later, but I think you could use it now.
preparing for a concert takes a lot more than just the immediate time right before the concert to be able to do the things that we do. These students have been training since they were six, seven years old, some of them, some of them middle school, some of them maybe when they first started high school, but just to prepare for the performance that we're about to give, these students have been working for probably five, six years to do the, the legwork, to have the skills to be able to do the things that they need to do. Um, uh, in fifth grade, I started playing drum set when I got to middle school, they, you know, you, had, you got to pick an elective, and, um, and I chose band because I thought it was going to be like rock band, and I was going to play drum set in it, so when I showed up and they're like, you're going to be playing percussion, I was like, what's that? The festival that we're preparing for right now is, is one of the bigger things that we do during the school year. It, um, it has a little bit more attached to it because when we go and perform, yes, we perform for our families and, and, and friends that come to see the performance, but also there will be three judges in the back of the room and they have a set of criteria that they're listening for. Um, and so all of the, the things that we've done to prepare, we're hopefully hitting all the good marks um, in what they're listening for as judges. What is it like before a concert? Um, I feel like it depends for the sections. Like, I feel like if I was a one-person section, it'd be a lot more stressful. So, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 It's like the oboe, but like, we have so many flutes that it's like not as stressful. Also depends on what event we're doing or something, because if it's like festival where you get graded on stuff, then it's a little bit more stressful yeah, that yeah. you want to do well compared to just like a concert that we play at, then it's less stressful. Yeah. For our festival performance, we're playing this piece called Speak to Me by Dana Wilson, and it's kind of jazzy, which is a really good fit with our group because we have a lot of students who are in and out of jazz band and went ensemble, so they're bringing kind of their jazz band lens to this piece. Uh, so that's really cool. And then the other piece that we're playing is called Polka and Fugue from the opera Schwanda the Bagpiper, which I'm sure you've all heard. Um, but it's really um, a very technical piece. And then it ends with this big, like bombastic ending, but it really highlights all the different sections of our group. <laughs> I'd say I get nervous before performing. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily stage fright, but I think everyone gets a little bit nervous because um, we all want to do our best in the performance, obviously. There's definitely like a sense of like unsettledness, but I don't know if it's necessarily nervousness or pressure. It's more of like excitement to be on the stage. And like something my uh, trumpet teacher always told me is if you feel comfortable on a stage while you're performing, you're not doing anything right because you should constantly be on edge and it's that feeling that keeps you focused and like engaged when you play. So it, it's pretty, it's not like scary, but it's, you know, you definitely feel something. So for festival, our call time is 2.30 at Oceanside High School. And, um, and so we all arrive at 2.30. Hopefully I'll have gotten all the percussion out of the car and down to our convention area. Everyone dresses in essentially all black. Boys have the option to wear a tuxedo and girls have the option to wear this black concert dress. I sometimes, like a lot of girls, sometimes have like a kind of black suit deal because that makes the runnings around a bit easier to manage. And so then after we all kind of convene and we all say like, haha, you look so funny because we're all dressed so, you know, alienly. The first place that you're sent when it gets to kind of be your time is the warm up room where we're allowed to kind of run through our pieces, any last minute commentary, and then we go into the main concert hall. In the main concert hall, you know, we come up, we play our pieces, the judges are there, the judges give their comments, and um, and then you leave, and then you get your score, and uh, yeah, it's always fun, always fun. Please welcome Canyon Crest Academy Wind Ensemble.
Greetings from the state with the most picturesque views, crispiest cerulean skies, whitest ocean caps, most viridian green palm trees, and the grayest couches. This, this is the new California, or more specifically, my living room. Well, it's time to study for my AP US history test, so I'll be back in a couple. Sleep train? Are you kidding me? Ah. Uh. Well, it's time for a walk. You may be wondering what differentiates even everyone else during this pandemic. To make it short and sweet, practically nothing. However, I am going through a major milestone in my life. I'm about to end my junior year, so I'll be applying to colleges over the summer. I want to major in business. I found it really interesting, especially during quarantine, to watch the stock market as things tend to go up and down really frequently. So reasonably, you may be wondering why someone like me who's going into business wants to make this kind of film. I like how I'm able to tell a story with this camera. See? I'm Danny, and welcome back to sports. Well, know how this is gonna end. The pandemic hasn't made anything easier. My mom works for the County of San Diego in the Health and Human Services Agency. Normally, my mom has face-to-face -face contact with her clients, but COVID has made it so everything happens over the phone. Additionally, two of her employees have been assigned to contact tracing, only increasing her workload. It's been an interesting experience to say the least, filled with uncertainties about the future. All I know is I have to keep working hard and make myself proud. Okay, so now it's 10 o'clock, which means it's time to study for my next test. Well, thanks for watching and have a good one.
It has been roughly a month since school has been out due to the coronavirus pandemic. In order to make use of my time, I started a job at Postmates delivering food. The purpose was not only to make money, but also to observe the effects of the quarantine on society and everyday life. While most people go grocery shopping, for some, these food delivery services are the only way they are able to attain food. Of course, I have a diligent routine to minimize the risk of getting the virus as well as spreading it. I start by putting on gloves and a mask, and I also regularly hand sanitize before and after delivering food to a house. At the end of the day, I leave my clothes in a bin and make sure not to wear it inside the house. With currently around 2.5 million confirmed cases around the world, there is no telling when this virus will stop spreading and when we will return to a normal way of life. So let's spend some time Wasting it away Your love is like music You went and changed the game We're breaking all the rules My side signs don't matter Today, 
tonight and into tomorrow morning. You can see this general surge of moisture moving from south to north right now. This is all due to a tropical disturbance near the western end of Cuba, which I'll show you in just a moment. But a quick look at Viper radar here. If you could finish that by, oh, how nice of you to join us, Ron. Only 30 minutes late this time. Sounds like a personal best. Sorry. So, we were just talking about the new project I will be signing you all. This quarter, we'll be working on a messaging bot for a theoretical search engine, and they're asking for a whole bunch of features. I'll share the document in a rubric with you, but here's the gist of it. The bot's got to be realistic you should be able to hold a normalish conversation with them as you would with a normal person. I'll be expecting to see all your code by next week. So that's going to be a bit of a crunch. But that's basically it. Again, all the info you need is in the document. If you have any questions, email me and we'll touch base a week from now. See you all then. Much shouldn't know that.
So everyone have a productive week? That's what I like to see. Well, let's start looking at the code. Ron, you're up first. Now you get to take care of your little brother, okay? Okay, so what does this mean for him? It's hard to say. Conditions like his can get worse and unpredictable. He'll have to be hospitalized for six weeks and if he gets worse, we'll move him to intensive care. The first round of treatment will be about two weeks, and we're just looking to get his T cell count up. Visitors are allowed, of course, and throughout his time here, uh, parents are allowed to stay with him. Um, did you want to come with me? Um, I don't think I can. I've got homework. But I'll try to call tonight. Okay, but just don't call too late because he goes to bed pretty early, okay? Alright. See you later. Hey bud, you're probably asleep right now. How are you? Sorry I haven't been down. I've been kind of busy. I'll try to visit soon. Anyway, I miss you. Love you. Bye. Hey, I thought you weren't gonna make it. My plan's changed, so. Well, I'm glad you're here. Everyone's downstairs. Uh, I'll walk you over. Emma's here! Hey! Hey! hey. hey. Oh, it's so good to see you! I'm great, how are you? Mom? Hello? What's wrong? What? N nothing's wrong. It all went well. That's why I called. He's fine. He hasn't woken up yet, but they think he'll be okay. You can't scare me like that. I'm sorry. Why don't you come here for a bit before visiting hours are up? I'm at Megan's, remember? And it's late, so... Listen, honey, I gotta go, okay? I I'll talk to you later. Miss you. Bye. Hey. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Is everything good? I don't know. It's Luke. I haven't seen him in a while, but I think he's okay. Why haven't you seen him? Um, I guess I just haven't found the time. What with school and everything, I've just been busy. It's just hard. I bet he misses you though. Yeah, it's not like 
I don't want to see him. I do. It's just that he's going to look different, and I'm not used to it, and I, I don't know that I could handle it. I mean, it's still Luke. He loves you. I know. Maybe I should go home. It, it's, it's late. Um, thank you for inviting me. And I'll let you get back to your party. No, wait. I'm here to talk if you need me. I know. I just... think I need to be alone right now. Oh, yeah. Of course. Sleep. I wish I saw you call. Well, the hospital food here is absolutely amazing. I mean, it makes me never want to leave. Anyways, I'm good, really. I mean, I feel like I've been here for weeks, which I guess is nice because then I feel like it's almost time to come home. But it feels like every time I really think I'm getting better, a new test comes back and gives me bad news. I don't know. I'm trying to stay positive. I really wish you were here. I'm pretty sure mom's convinced she's qualified to be a doctor now. I mean, I tried to explain that WikiHow isn't the best place to look for cures. Wait, here she is. Yeah, okay, I'm leaving him a message. Alright, looks like I gotta run. Anyways, love you, Em. I'll catch you later, okay? Born in Vietnam, I raised in Vietnam. When uh, communists take over, we have really difficult time. Even the lie and the lay how to living, they control too much. We cannot handle anymore. That's why we try to escape from Vietnam. My name is Van, and my whole name is Vo Thi Thuy Van. Uh, in here, I am the general manager. My name is Ngip. My company name is Asap Custom Cabinet. I, I am the owner. <laughs> I like my job. I love my job. When I, I get here, my game come true. I change everything. And I can believe it. I own a small business here. The game come true. start to do the cabinet in here. The first step, we cut the wood. He cut the wood right now. 
Then he built a cabinet. It's not easy when you escape from Vietnam to Thailand. If you get cash from them, you have to go to the jail. But I'm lucky. My dad is passed away after communists take over Vietnam, and he go in jail and he died. A lot of people die when they, they took you there, that's why I scared. And I left on the book and I get up on the Malaysia and they took me go to an island. That island they call Pulau Bidang. And nobody around, you know, small island, but a lot of people. And I stayed there 18 months. We escaped from Vietnam to Thailand. My mom, my sibling, brother, sister, nephew, and niece. The whole camp, the Thai I live in there is around 30,000 people. I stay in there about three months. In the camp, it's really difficult time in there, and we have support from U.S. government. But of course, it, the life is not easy. Everything is dirty over there, but we have to live, and we're waiting for the time we come to USA. I think I stuck there, get me too long, and maybe I have to go back to Vietnam. I have to leave. If I don't leave, I'm dying. I'm lucky I don't go back. American come touch me and get out. After we build the cabinet, we come in here, we make the door. We make the dimension and we cut the wood. After we build the door, we have to put the party. You see, like this. My brother being here first and sponsor us go to here. My brother-in-law, he sent me the letter. He said he took care of me. Then he sent another another letter to go to the government the USA. And they call me and come interview and ask me. After the door, we go in here for sent. After the party, try. We send it. This is the finished send already. I believe he come in here at the same time with me, but about four months later. And he lived together with my family, and we met each other in there. My mom liked him, and that's why he said he is a good man and go get married with him, okay? <laughs> I have four children. My daughter, she's pregnant now. <laughs> yeah, that is my first one. <laughs> when I be in Vietnam, I try to be medical. Uh, when I come in here, I try to go back to medical field, but you know, I am the oldest in the sister in the family. My mom is already have to sacrifice for them, and they successful, they go good career and they have a good job. After done, we painting. We have a pirate, Thailand pilot, three times. They took everything, gold, diamond, gold, everything on the book. A lot of people. I think about six, seven people, they come on the book, and they have a gun, they show, hey, give me money. Yeah, we don't have anything at all and we start everything beginning. They have to move me around before I come in here. I have to go to the Bangkok. After Bangkok, they move me to Hong Kong. And after Hong Kong, they move me to Alaska. After Alaska, move me to San Diego. Yeah, that I have the whole trip. <laughs> when I come to uh, USA, I, I work on the uh, assembly together with the supervisor. Supervisor asked me, one can the job? He said, okay, yeah. And he said, come here and work on the wood shop. Then uh, they show me how to build the cabinet. But I much a small, small cabinet or do something on uh, my house, on the garage. You know, and I build some small, small for my friend, my family, and everybody is cheered. And they're like, oh, Nip, you do very good, very nice. Go ahead, do the shop. That, that time I opened the shop. 
He's really busy in here, super park in here. And I quit my job, I come in here, help him. When I open the shop, you know, all the paperwork, I don't know if my wife, she take care of everything. I don't know, it looks good. I, I, I can do all the work, but I can do the paperwork. That's why I, my wife helped me do all that. This one, you have to wait at least for hour for drive. This is the first coat. We have to do second coat. After second coat, we have to send again. After, we have to do the third one. The third one is final. All the guy over there, it go with my husband. <laughs> They thinking about my brother, work together. When I, I come here <laughs> every day, 7.30 I left. And I go on the side job. We done all the cabinet. We put on the, uh, the, the truck and go with two more guys who put together on the house. After the painting, the cabinet is done. It's ready for the pick it up. I like American a lot better than Vietnam. First, I come to American and I'm happy, you know, freedom. I can go anywhere I want. The weather is good too, and uh, the food is good too. Everything good in here. doing home so late? Sorry, Ma. I, I had to work late. Well, I hope you didn't forget my meds. You mean painkillers? Don't call them that. Makes me sound like an addict. Sorry. You know, Ma, these, it's getting dangerous getting these things. I don't want to get in any trouble. Is it the money? Is it about the money? No, it's not like that. Selfish child. You can't even take care of your old sick mother. You know, Ma, uh, 
There's this girl I think I like at work. <laughs> She'd be wasting her time on you. Listen, Terry. How are you going to take care of somebody else and take care of your sick mom? <coughs> the world is in a safe place. Your home is here with me. This is where you're safe. All right. Love you, Mom. Hungry, Ma? Why? So you can feed me some more of that microwavable shit? <coughs> you don't even make me real food. You know everything's been stressful at work, and, and I haven't had time to take care of you best. Maybe if I could take a vacation. <laughs> Just like your father, you're gonna run out, huh? <laughs> Why, so you can go and enjoy yourself? I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get rid of me. No. Just listen, okay? I won't go. Sorry. It's a stupid idea anyways, I guess. Don't bring it up again. Do you understand me? Don't ever bring that up again. You're not leaving me. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> You good, Terry? Help me up. 
now. Terry, help me now. Get back in my chair. Help me. Boy, pick me up. Help me now. Boy, you better help me in this chair. Help me. Terry, don't you leave me. No, don't leave me. Taxi for the airport, please. Hi, my name is Alfie Brightson, uh, and I'm a senior at Torrey Pines High School. Hi, my name is Jessica Lane, and I'm a senior at Canyon Crest Academy. My name is William, and I'm a senior at Adair Charter School. However, I attended CCA, Canyon Crest Academy, for three years. When I graduate this year in June, uh, I will be taking a gap year. After that, um, I will be going back to the United Kingdom for school. I'm planning on going to college. I don't know where yet. And uh, my major is going to be history. And I'm aiming to do a minor in biology. My plan for the future is to first attend a four-year institution. My primary goal is to aim for medical school. So I would definitely go straight into a four-year institution and finish my undergraduate as fast as possible and apply to medical school. And Being a senior in high school is really stressful and not at all what I thought it would be. I thought senior year would be more of a breeze and more fun, but it's turned out to be kind of a really hard experience. Being a senior is pretty much the easiest year of your life. I've had no troubles. The day before school started, which was supposed to be my first day of senior year, I said no. Where I'm, I, I'm talking like, I'm in the car dropping off my siblings for the first day of elementary school. I'm in the car and, I'm, and I say, I can't do it. And I leave. And I, I decided to transfer. Since the structure is much different and how you get to graduate, I had, so, I had so many credits that really I only had to do three or four more courses in order for me to graduate. But it worked for me because I'm super independent and I, I love independence and I love making my own schedule. And so it was so efficient because it worked with my mental state. I think I applied to either 15 or 16 schools. And I applied to that because I had a college counselor telling me that that was what I needed to apply to and that I wasn't really going to get into many of those. Um, and I, looking back on that, I really think it was a waste of time and a waste of money. I only applied to two schools. The application to the UK is the easiest thing. You could do it in a day, but you write a personal statement and in one sheet that gets sent out to the amount of schools that you apply to and that's it and it's like twenty dollars <laughs> Uncertainty that I feel right now is really nerve-wracking and it's really hard to wait from when you submit which is like I submitted all, all of my things in uh, by December and to wait another four months to see if I got into my dream school is like hard and also it's like a it's like hitting a dart in the dark really because you never knew which school was gonna give you the most money scholarship wise so I basically just applied to a bunch to see which one I, I, with the hopes that one of them would pull through. Currently in the process, I'm waiting for my response from the two schools that I applied to. I was like dead set on going to Loyola, but the day before I was supposed to take a plane to Chicago, I get an offer from Pepperdine and they gave me a scholarship and the state of California gave me grants. And all of those culminated in a near free ride for me. So when I looked at that, I was like, this is an opportunity I cannot miss. Like, this is like, this was obviously, like everything happens for a reason. Well, you feel like people are getting in around you and um, I don't know, it kind of diminishes my self-worth a little bit thinking like, oh, well, maybe I just won't get in. We have a men mentality issue. We have a huge social issue in America where um, we put emphasis on this ranking and it's mentally hurting people. I mean, 
when I heard the stories coming in from like public school and like the people and like how they were so upset that they didn't get it, it's that's mentally damaging. Like to think of yourself as lesser because you didn't get in somewhere. This system is so cutthroat. It wants you to be like this robot, but no one is a ro like no one is a robot. So people think they're not good enough for the school when in reality that school was just filling out quotas. It's not only a game, but a business. And I think that it's all about, like I said, connections. And it's all about who you know, it's all about, and I'm not saying that that's illegal or anything. I'm just saying that that's, it's just how it works. And for colleges too, on their side of it, it's all about numbers and representation and a lot about race and a lot about economic backgrounds too. The reason I think I got into these, to all these schools is because I hit the head on the nail about what they wanted. I think these schools, they really, really want to see someone who had a different experience than everyone else. And I truly did. I really emphasized the fact that I was a male competitive gymnast. I experienced so many social issues regarding it. And I talked about how we could fix it. That was in my common application. I feel like I'm not ready. I'm not ready for university just yet. You know, I feel like a lot of students aren't, but the pressure of society just pushes them into it. You know, I feel like for me, I could probably go and I could live by myself and go straight into university, but I don't want to. I still got things I want to do, places I want to go before I dedicate four years to, you know, university. It was like, it was like a light bulb went off and it was like, you should take a year off. You know, a gap year, it shouldn't be something serious. It should just be something you want to do, something fun. I'm finding internships for myself. I'm like staying at my job I have right now for a little bit and then hopefully moving on from there and getting a better paid job. In high school, I've always tried to be the best academically that I can possibly be. Um, I really was hard on myself if I got to be on a test or in a class. Um, which didn't happen very often, but you know, it's still like, it's a scary thing. I think that a lot of seniors are in my same position, but to me, sometimes it doesn't feel that way because, um, a lot of people got into early schools and everybody's congratulating them and they put it in their Instagram bio. And it's just like, that's hard to see other people getting into your dream school or seeing other people having what they wanted already and you've worked so hard and you haven't gotten that already. So it's hard to be patient. I feel like other high school students are definitely a lot more stressed about the applications than I am. I feel like there's a lot more pressure on them. I, I feel like there's no social pressure on me personally because there's not a big history of university in my family. So I don't have pressure from anyone to go there. You know, it's just up to me, it's my own choice. Both my parents went to really high level schools, actually my top two schools. So my dad went to Stanford for undergrad and my mom went to UCLA for undergrad. And now they're both surgeons. So my mom's a breast cancer surgeon and my dad's a vascular surgeon. They just expect from me what they are themselves which is really hard to put on a kid and it's always been like that like not even with school with sports and um i don't think they do it on purpose and i i know that they definitely um don't want to put pressure on me but i think that like because of the background that they have they don't expect anything less from me like my parents at least expect that i'll get into a uc school so both of my parents have completed graduate degrees they are both immigrants, so they're both, they're both from Europe. My dad's from Trinidad and my mom's from Europe. Um, and so yeah, they had uh, definitely different experience. And especially having an older sister, having, seeing her go through the entire process, they seem to have, they seem to think that that process was the only way. So then when it came to me, we kind of emulated that. And but in reality, in the process, in, in America, you have so many opportunities. So really, it was, we were learning every step of the way, basically. This idea of going to a charter school was like, what is, what is going to happen with you? Uh, a person who went to this public school for three years switched to a charter school that's not even on the ranking. How would they look at you compared to a person who graduated from CCA? So 
advice to oncoming seniors. I would tell you to please don't apply to over 15 schools, over 10 schools, because realistically you will get into one of those schools. Don't apply somewhere that you don't want to go because it's not going to make you happy to write those essays. And for me, I had a, such a good time writing those Stanford essays because I loved I loved the school and I loved what the essays were about. And I was so excited to have a chance to get in there. Take it slow. Don't try and rush through everything. Don't try and do it all in the first semester. Don't pile yourself with APs, you know? Don't go overboard on all the crazy hard classes. It's, it doesn't, doesn't really matter that much you know you could still take a hard class here and there but this is your last year of high school you want to enjoy yourself you want to have fun you want to take your time you know and enjoy it while it lasts really Uh, sports has been a huge part of my life. I enjoy seeing the team come together. A lot of people think we can't play because we're in a wheelchair, but when we show them, sometimes we, we just, we can surprise them. You just love sports, it's, you can't, you know, with the injury or disability, it doesn't really affect uh, your love for that sport. Hi, my name is Deshaun, or Coach D, and I've been coaching the San Diego Hammer varsity team. This is my uh, fifth year coaching. It's been exciting, it's been fun, and, and every season the team, you know, is just improving, uh, seeing the players build their chemistry. Uh, I played sports in high school, um, and I was in a car crash, and I thought I'd never be able to play sports after my spinal cord injury. And uh, once I found wheelchair sports, um, it was really like, uh, kind of like the light went off for me again, because at a point I was kind of down and just felt like something was missing. And then I found wheelchair sports and I was really excited to get involved. And the first sport I heard about was soccer and it was kind of, thought it was like a weird joke or something when someone told me about it. I'm like, doesn't make sense. Uh, I started playing basketball um, in San Diego. I played for about 15 years and then moved on to coaching. What I like about Coach D is that um, he's very understandable. He always pushes us, he always wants to get better, he always does drills. He's been a good coach, good person to talk to. Say so, like we're like going through something like about our disabilities and since we're younger, he has more experience. So um, just asking him for her advice. Today is a practice, basically open gym. We uh, just had a tournament in San Francisco and uh, most of the guys are recovering, so it's pretty much just like a kind of a open gym, shoot around and sharpen your skills day. During practice, we work on uh, layups, team drills, stuff like that. My favorite part of practice is uh, playing because I get to play and work out and it's something that I, I enjoy. We all get along and we, we all have a good time and we never put each other down if we're losing or if we're winning. I get to hang out with other people and work just like me and just have fun, shoot, better my skills at basketball, stuff like that. You know, I love basketball, it's my favorite sport and I love just getting better every day. I want to go professional when I'm older, I want to get a scholarship, so I'm just trying to get better every day and try to push my teammates so we can win. We can win tournaments, we can be a better team. Treat people like, uh, like you treat anybody. Like treat anybody 
say hi, how's it going? And if you see the sport and you're curious, just say, oh, that's cool. I was curious, how does it work? Instead of maybe people thinking uh, that's awkward or weird, or maybe they, they feel like a person can't do certain things. I mean, I feel like I could do like anything anybody else can do, I just can't walk. So that really, most people will say, oh, you're in a wheelchair, you, you can't do that. But I'm like, that doesn't mean nothing. I can do what I want to do, play what I want to play. I wish people knew about the sports we play, how we play it, and that we just like other people. Yeah, there hasn't been any dunks. <laughs> that, that's one limitation, I'd say. But yeah, the sport itself, same team effort, camaraderie. It's actually a little tougher to me if you think about it, it's all upper body, the whole game, pushing up and down, shooting. And uh, yeah, your arms have to do everything with their body, so. My disability hasn't stopped me because um, it's made me stronger as a person and what it made me to not just be in bed and cry all over because I have a disability and be more um, active. My disability hasn't stopped me because if, even if I have disabilities, I can still play basketball like everyone else. I can still, still throw the football. I can, I can still do a lot of things even if I'm, I have disabilities. Um, I can go many places, I can get in my car, I can do, I can do what every normal person can do. I feel like I need to get more footage because I did absolutely, I didn't get a lot of footage this week. So basically, this is how my week went. I came in and um, I came in at like 6, 6.30 a.m. last Friday and I slept at NYU dorm and then I went to my audition. <laughs> I basically have been doing ballet forever, but then as I grew up, I realized there's so much more that you can do with dance. I grew up performing, and it's my passion, and I want to do it for the rest of my life, and that's what I have my main focus on. I started dance when I was three years old. Um, I started at this tiny little shack called Sage Door, and it was a ballet class, and I loved it a lot. I just loved the whole process of class, and like I loved the scene. And then I transferred to San Alijo Dance Academy, and I stayed with them until seventh or eighth grade, and then I went to danceology for like high school and middle school, and that was where a lot of my training like progressed. So when I was applying to schools, I was really, really, really indecisive about what I wanted to major in because I'm already an indecisive person to start with. So um, making bigger decisions like what to major in and you know where my future is going was really like really mind boggling for me because it's you're literally deciding what your future is in those moments. And so I chose dance because it was, like, I grew up doing it. I really cannot live without it, and it's definitely something that I would love doing in the future. And I would love to dance backup with any artist or um, as a core member on a Broadway show. Or um, I also, when I was younger, I also wanted to be, like, a Laker girl at, like, the Lakers game. So <laughs> a lot of the commercial dance um, opportunities are very, like, performance-based, and I would love to do that or be a choreographer for any of the commercial dance opportunities, honestly. For this audition in Chicago, it's a college audition for the BFA program at Columbia. The BFA program is really cool, actually. They have um, this like underground dance program where they focus on b-boying, breakdancing, and like ciphering, and all that cool like underground style stuff. 
and you basically train every day and then they'll get you more into the commercial dance industry. For this audition, I submitted an essay and then you go in to the actual school and I'm going to perform either one or two solos. I have one prepared and I think I have to work a little bit more on the second one. I just finished the audition and it went really well and that's good so so fun it was so fun oh my god it was it was it went really well it felt so good oh my god i know i've said it like five times but it really did feel amazing to be able to do that solo in a full dance studio with like the marley was perfect and my socks like perfect friction perfect scenario it just felt amazing So one day I was drinking out of this water fountain over here and when the water hit my mouth there was this instant bubbly sensation. It almost tasted like Alka-Seltzer but also had this burning at the back of my throat. So I instantly spit it out and I knew we had to do some testing here. So I'm just going to get a quick sample of this and if you come over here you can also see that there is some blue hanging around, which may mean that it could be copper in the water. But there's definitely something else going on here. If you could hear in the bottle, there is some fizzing going on. So here I have a, a strip of pH paper. And so what pH is, is it's a scale from one to 14. A pH of seven means that it's neither basic nor acidic. A uh, pH below 7 is acidic, a pH above 7 is basic. Yeah, let's test this water. It's starting to turn a little blue. Now, I don't know if that's from the possibility of there being copper in there, but for this paper, um, a pH of this greenish blue is a pH of uh, 9 to 10. So, this is definitely basic. Oh, ew, oh my god. Oh my god. They're kids, they took a vial of this stuff. They're gonna test you. They're testing it? Do they have any normal water? Yes. Ah. Ah. What's that? That's what we're figuring out here. Ah. What'd you guys do to the water? <laughs> oh, this looks weird. Whoa! <laughs> what? That's not water, dude. That's like fizzy. Dude, dude, that's not water. Taste it. Taste it. Taste, it. taste it. it, dude. Dude, try it. There's probably it's, I think it's Sprite. The pH of safe drinking water is from 6.5 to 8.5, but from this test, uh, it is apparent that the pH is from 9 to 10, meaning that it is definitely not safe to drink. So we have this water quality test kit and we also have a sample of the water from the water fountain that we just examined. Let's take a look of what's inside this box. So this tests for pH, total alkalinity, total chlorine, total hardness, hydrogen sulfide, iron bacteria, iron, copper, nitrates, and nitrites. Now we're going to use this test sample that was again from the water fountain at CCA and we're going to compare it to this normal water fountain and just to see how it compares, we're gonna we're gonna test the water from this dog water fountain. We're gonna start off with the uh, copper test. This is the dog water, and this one seems to have no copper in it. So this is the uh, regular water fountain. Unsurprisingly, it also does not have any water in it. And now, this is the CCA water. The dog water you can see is a little darker than the regular water fountain. That means it has like maybe a little more copper in it. The only thing is that this. It looks like a three on the scale, which means caution. So now we're gonna do the iron test. First test the dog water. So this has a low amount of iron in it. Now this is the regular water fountain. It also has a low amount of 
iron in it. And now let's try the CCA water. So for the CCA water, it turned um, a, li a little blue, which is a 0.3 on the scale for iron. And it's actually the ideal amount of iron in water. So that's at least good. So now we're doing a test for nitrates and nitrites. Uh, so we'll start with the dog water. So it has a safe amount of nitrates and nitrites. Now for the regular water, uh, this also has a safe amount of nitrates and nitrites. And now for the CCA water. And this also has a safe amount of nitrates and nitrites. So that is definitely not the issue here. All right, now for our last test, this is the four in one test. For the total hardness, it appears to be at around 120, which is in between soft and hard. For the chlorine, it has a score of one, and the pH, it's around 7.8. So these are all pretty normal, maybe a little on, a little on the hard side. Now let's test the uh, regular water fountain. Total hardness seems to be around a 25, so it's definitely much better than the dog water fountain. It seems to have a pH of also 7.8. The total alkalinity is around 40. Total chlorine in here is around 0.5. So this is actually much better results than the dog water. Okay, so for the CCA water, the total hardness in between 120 and 250, which is much harder than uh, the other two water fountains. The total chlorine is around a one. Total alkalinity around 40. The pH for the CCA water is um, off this scale, in the, but this scale maxes out at 8.4. And as we tested before, it was it was from nine to 10 pH. This water is definitely not safe to drink for anyone. So earlier today, we checked up on the problematic water fountain and we're pleasantly surprised to see that it, it's mostly fixed. In this process, we learned a great deal about testing water and we found out how easy it is to do so as you can go to your local hardware store and pick up a water testing kit. Even though in this case, we could easily tell that there was something wrong with the water, not all issues with water can be sensed, which is why you should consider testing your water before drinking it. Relax. Visualize. Walk up to the register. Look them in the eyes. Show them what you got. Tell them what you need. Got this. Don't got this. Look at you. You're a coward, a worthless coward. I'm doing this right here, right now. Not a coward, not a coward.
the chicken sandwich, and you guys gave me the beef one. Um, can you fix it? Thank you. Yeah, that wasn't bad. <laughs> All you had to do was go in there, look them in the eye, act like an adult, and they fixed your order. All you had to do was ask. <laughs> Not a coward. <laughs>